Steve Olson. I'm a Dharma teacher in training, and I'll be giving the uh, Dharma talk to start with. And Judy Reutemann will is a Zen master and will answer all your questions, no matter how simple, no matter how complex. She can handle it, and I've. Uh, <laughs> if you satisfied her, you won't be satisfied, but she'll give you good answers. <laughs> So about 10 years ago or so, uh, we were moving my parents into uh, uh, senior citizen housing that they were uh, you know, fully mobile and had its own kitchen and they did their own cooking. Uh, and we had a, uh, we went through our house and uh, you know, different kids took different things because this was a lot smaller. And I remember when we went through the cedar chest, down at the bottom of the cedar chest, there was a piece of material, it was white, it was very nice. And I said, you know, what's this? It doesn't seem to be anything. And it turned out that that was uh, something that Chris had. Now, Chris, was my great grandmother, or my great, yeah, my great grandmother. So I only knew her right at the end of her life because I know she was gone by the time, sometime when I was four. And so I have just very small remembrances, but I saw that and I thought, thinking about it now that that may be the last physical artifact that we had from Chris that I don't know of anything else other than a few old photos but that may be the last thing that Chris owned that anybody had and I don't know what happened to it I imagine it was pitched uh, when we cleaned out the cedar chest and uh, then I got thinking about Chris and what do I remember about Chris? Well, I have about three images in my mind or four images in my mind. You know, I have her sitting in a chair and I have her standing in her bedroom and I have her in the kitchen with my grandmother and my mother making a, a, a Sunday dinner. And that's really all I remember. So I really didn't know Chris at all. I mean, I, I really don't know she lived a long life, I assume, because <laughs> I don't know, I don't track uh, these old family things very well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure how old she was when she died, uh, but she was my great grandmother, so she had to be up there. Uh, and then I thought, you know, this, this to me is emptiness. This is uh, no thingness. This is, you know, if you want to come from the other side, it's interpenetration. But, you know, this is more than saying that my pencils, my pencil are, are going to expire or, you know, the, this plant's going to die and it's not going to be anymore. These are people that lived a full life and had a lot of activity, I assume, <laughs> and, and are gone. Uh, and there's no physical remembrance other than a few pictures. Uh, if you, uh, I think one of the points of emptiness is that if things weren't empty, if things did have a permanent existence, it really wouldn't matter how you treated things, people. Uh, because you know you might see him again in another thousand years and you could correct it uh, if people live forever if they had a permanent existence but people don't have a permanent existence they go away and i think it's very important that we you know treat people well uh, when we meet them uh, because you never know what they might get hit by a bus and be gone instantly uh, and I think that's particularly true now. I think that 
I'm reminded of that with the COVID-19 thing, because I think this is going to be, uh, we're going to, it's going to be much larger in this country than it is uh, in Italy. Uh, you know, we're losing so many people a day now that we're going to, you know, in a, in a week or so, we'll blow by Italy on the death rate. We're already on the, we're already on the most confirmed cases and we haven't even been testing very well. So it's going to be greater. So I think you're going to run into people that have COVID-19 and, and I hope nobody thinks, oh my gosh, I, you know, you want to stay away from them, but you know, be friendly and talk and, and uh, try to help them. Uh, and I think that's probably about all I've got to say today. So I'll turn it over to Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, so before I ask people for questions, um, I'd like to ask everyone, I did by chat, but not everyone saw it, because everyone be sure to mute yourself so that people who are watching in speaker view don't suddenly see your picture come up. And then if you have a question, that's when you unmute yourself. So if people could mute themselves, that would be really great. I can't see everyone. Okay. Before I ask for questions, I, I wanted to say that um, while I was sitting and, you know, I was noticing, you know, this mudra, this hand mudra, and we often talk about this hand mudra and you have it, you focus it, you know, um, three inches, three fingers below your, your belly button around that. And that's your chan chan, your power spot. And that it, it, you get this sort of real strength from having this mudra here. But we also sometimes describe the mudra as, as well, this I'll show the mudra, uh, as uh, holding the feet of the baby Buddha. So it's like you're holding Buddha's feet, you know, in your hands. But while I was sitting today, I suddenly had this sense of this mudra, we're all holding each other in this mudra that I'm holding you and you're holding me and we're holding the planet and that this, you know, it's like a cradle and we're just cradling each other. And here we are, we're not in the same room, we're just pictures on a screen. And when you unmute yourself, your sound coming through some kind of electronic device, but we're still holding each other. And that's kind of remarkable. And so I wanted to mention that. And um, Steve, if I haven't already, thank you for your talk. Um, so are there any questions? Tim, yeah. Oh, you're so great. You always have a question, sometimes too. I don't okay. know if that's great or not, but <laughs> <It's great. laughs> no, I, as I was reading the notes on the Heart Sutra, getting prepping for the class today, mm -hmm. Um, it reminded me of something that's confused me for a while, and that's the word Dharma. Mm -hmm. So Dharma is one of the three jewels, obviously, and it's our practice, and it's the sutras, and it's the teachings, and we use it that way. But in the Heart Sutra, it talks about all Dharmas are empty, and we talk about the word Dharma meaning modes of existence. Or, mm -hmm. um, and so that's confused me for a while, what those it's this one word, but it seems to have different meanings. And I wonder how to square that. You don't have to square. There are a lot of words in English that have different meanings. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so Dharma means two things. And one is the two things. And the other is sort of the constituents of existence, not the modes of existence, but the constituents of existence, sort of like atoms, except not just physical, but also like mental and whatever, um, all kinds of, any kind of existence, you know, it's, it's carried in, in Dharma. So they're like the constituents of existence. And the, there's a relationship between the two. It's not like some English words where you have these meanings that are completely distinct. There's also a relationship. And the relationship is that the teachings come through 
the constituents of existence. The teachings doesn't just mean, like if you look at, at Steve, you know, he's all these books on his shelves. Wow. And you say, wow, Steve, you read a lot, man, you must be really smart. Um, but it's also that uh, it's not just the teachings of the sutras or the teachings of the commentaries on the sutras or the teachings of the commentaries on the commentaries of the sutras or the teachings of people who somehow have the title of teacher. It's not just that. Like the screen right now is teaching us. And your body, in whatever posture you're sitting, your body right now is teaching you. And when you look around whatever room you're in, that is teaching you. And if you have a window to look out of, like I do, and I have these trees and everything like that, that's teaching me. And when your phone makes a sound, some kind of notification ring or something, that's teaching you and your animals are teaching you and your friends are teaching you. Everything is always teaching you. So in that sense, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, they're not that unrelated. But yeah, it basically has this, Dharma means teachings, and it also means the constituents of existence. So thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. And someone emailed me, I don't want to out them unless they want to out themselves earlier, and I said, oh, that's a good question, you should ask it during the Dharma talk, and I think that person just unmuted themselves. Would you like to speak? He did, he did, and I will out myself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so the question I had asked you this um, is when we pray and uh, when we could you speak a little it's hard to hear you could you speak up a little sorry give prostrations who exactly um, or what exactly do we pray to yeah that's a wonderful question yeah so we're not praying when we do prostrations um, in some forms of Buddhism there is something similar to prayer but not in Zen so in Zen, when we chant, for example, to Kwan Sen Bosal, we're sort of not just invoking Kwan Sen Bosal, but this is the Bodhisattva of compassion, but also becoming Kwan Sen Bosal. So it's not like a petitionary prayer. And when we do prostrations, we're not praying. So there are many ways to look at prostrations. And one way is to say that your small self is bowing to your big self. So your big self is not limited in time and space. It's not limited to your body. It's not limited to the course of your life, to the time of your life. Your, your big self is really huge. And so your small self is bowing to your big self. That's one way of looking at it. And then some people say you're bowing to expiate. Um, the word sin doesn't quite work in Buddhism, but whatever the equivalent would be, you're bowing to expiate You know your particular... Um, the, the particular kinds of bad actions you've done. And there, there even you can find online, you can find um, a, a videotape where this guy intones, you know, number 36, um, kicking the dog or something like that, you know? So there, there's this kind of long list of sort of sins. And so each one corresponding to a bow or each bow corresponding to a sin. That's that that way I, I don't that's too much thinking, I think. It's just too much thinking. The way I think of prostrations is that we're apes. We're primates. That's what we are. And if you think about primates, when they are completely like giving up power. What's the posture they take? It's the posture of prostration. You know, the head's on the ground, the butt's in the air, the hands are where they can't, you know, hurt whatever animal is, is trying to threaten them, you know. And so it's this, it's this posture of total, um, you, you're just completely giving up your power, you know. It's this, and there are a lot of religions that realize this, like Islam is really big on prostrations too. And even in Judaism, which you don't think of that, um, my father as a cantor on the high holidays, there would be this one prayer where he would do a prostration in front of the congregation. So this notion of just totally giving up your power, and then you stand up again. And then you do go down and you come up, and you go down and you come up. And it's almost like it rewires 
it, it kind of rewires your brain and your body. It rewires your whole nervous system over time. So it's a, it's a wonderful practice and it doesn't involve thinking. You know, when you're sitting on the cushion, it's hard not to think, you know, you have to keep bringing your mind back and bringing your mind back and bringing your mind back. Everyone here has experienced that. So when, you, when you're sitting on the cushion, you know, your thoughts come up and it's hard not to be dragged by them. Um, when you're chanting, you know, you're, you're paying attention to the, the rhythm and the everything like that. And, and maybe you know the meaning of the words. And so you think of the meaning of the words, which is not a bad thing to do at all. Um, I, I highly encourage people to download Stan's interlinear translation of the chants. It can be really wonderful. But the fact is, you, there's still a, a kind of frontal lobe engagement there. When you're doing walking meditation, you know, it's hard to do walking meditation and say, oh, wow, look at that, you know, especially when we get back into our building, which I hope someday we do, you know, and we have all this beautiful art and, and you know, you look out the windows and you see trees and everything like that. And it's, it's really hard not to, not to have your mind sort of doing that. But when you're doing prostrations, and I know that there are people who tell me that this, that they're not like this, but most people, when they're doing prostrations, it's really hard to think because it's physically very demanding. Everyone's experience, everyone who's done prostrations has experienced is physically very demanding. And so your, your thinking mind sort of is really quiet. And that allows this kind of reprogramming to happen. So in Korea, traditionally, if you went to um, a, a, a Zen teacher and you said, you know, my, my partner just left me, I lost my job, my kid is, is, you know, dropped out of school. What should I do? What they would say is thousand bows a day, <laughs> you know, 500 bows a day, something like that. And the point is that this obsessive mind that is going always, you know, my life is so hard. It's, and it may be really hard. You know, I'm not saying that things aren't hard. You may be in a very hard situation, but having your mind going around and around and around about how hard your situation is, that isn't helping. And so it, it just cuts us out of all that kind of thinking, thinking, thinking that we do. So that's why prostration is a very, very powerful practice, that we're not bowing to any particular deity or anything like that. And it's not like prayer. It's just pure action, absolutely pure action. And I encourage everyone to do it. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Oh, I also want to say one more thing about prostration for those people with small children. Um, when you're sitting, your kids see a lap. When you're doing prostrations, they know you're busy. So that's another very practical reason to do prostrations at home is that your kids know you're busy. So thank you very much, Matt. Are there any other questions? Hello, I have a question. Sure. Um, you know, I noticed that we are not chanting and I, and I noticed, I, I know that, that would be hard, but um, mm -hmm. what do you recommend? Um, For chanting? Yes. Yeah. So you're a musician, so you know why we're not chanting. We're not chanting because of the feedback. Right. And, yeah. So for people who don't know, um, when you do this kind of thing, um, if two people try to do anything in unison, there's a, there's a time lag. And so you can't do anything in unison and it gets really crazy. Um, and when you see those things of the musicians, you know, and you think there's, no, they're not doing it together. They're doing it to like a click track. They're doing it separately. And then someone combines all the videos. That's what's going on there. Um, so, yeah. So if you want to chant at home, chant at home. Why not? You don't even really need use a mop talk. If you want to keep time, you can keep time two wooden spoons, you know, whatever. Just, and you don't even really need to do that. But yeah, so um, chanting is a wonderful practice. I really miss doing it together. And there's some, there's some groups that, um, and we're, we're going to be doing this in the early, we started, we're going to start doing early morning practice. And for early morning practice, we're going to have one person do the bell chant and then everyone else will be on mute but singing along just the way we did the the four great vows um and so we're going to do that in the morning 
but the the four chants with all the prostrations it just didn't seem like that would work very well on youtube but yeah if you if you want to do chanting at home i encourage you to do it at home and um if sort of in order of um recommendation if you're going to chant only one thing chant the heart sutra if you're going to chant only two things the heart sutra and the great durrani if you're going to chant more than that do all four and then of course um you know if you want to chant kwan sen bosal for someone who who is in difficulty maybe ill maybe financial difficulty emotional difficulty um you can chant that and if you um want to chant uh, jijang bosal for people who died you can do that there's a very elaborate beginning and end to those chants you don't have to do that you can just do the middle part where you repeat and um in fact i i've asked people and um if you haven't responded you might want to i've asked people because we used to on wednesday night we would chant jijang bosal or kwan sen bosal you know uh, regularly for people who needed it and even if we had no names we'd do it anyway but since we're not doing that if you would like to be on our sort of chant list there are people that when someone says please chant for so and so and i send the name out and then on our own we chant for them although stan and i do it together tom and wendy can do it together too but most people would be doing it on their own um and if you would like to do that just email us at kansasandcenter@gmail.com um, and I'll put you on the list of people who are notified to chant for people. So thank you for your question. Yeah, chanting is a wonderful practice. And uh I want to say a little bit about chanting although right now it doesn't really imply the when you chant together it's about listening. It's not about your own voice, it's about listening. And it's not about sounding good. You know, whether you're chanting alone or whether you're chanting with other people, it's not about sounding good. um it's just about 100% doing this physical action so thank you very much for your question any other questions well If there are no questions, we have announcements. And the big announcement is to remind people that at one o'clock we're having the um, class on the Heart Sutra, and we're asking ten dollars if you can afford it, and you can pay on our PayPal account. I know a lot of people are having a lot of problems right now, so um, if you can't, you're still welcome to come. And if you go to our web page, you'll find the readings for that. They're very short. We're going to also have a class um, in about a month. I haven't decided exactly what it's going to be, but we look out for uh, an announcement in the next few days for another class. Um, we have our Tuesday, Thursday, six uh, forty-five uh, practice, and the reason for that time is to encourage people to um, to um, do their prostrations at 6:30 before they join us and then of course we have the sunday practice and um oh i see there are all these notes here what are, what are these 6:45 a.m. yes a.m. yes okay oh i see so you say oh, did you say tuesday and thursday for those uh tuesday and thursday at 6:45 a.m. yes thank you Okay and oh I see there's all these great little uh chats about um resources so check the chat box before you leave for resources and what we've been doing uh well, we've been doing going to this once before so um now what I'm going to unmute all and I'm going to put people into breakout rooms at random so if you want to put down so if you need to leave now leave now so I know how many breakout rooms we have and then in about 1 or 2 minutes put everyone in break rooms and then we have to talk together and hang out as we're having cookies oh hi holly holly's our niece <laughs> um so if you want to hang out in the break room that would be great and so leave now if you don't want to be in the break room cuz i i want to have the right number i want to have about 4 or 5 right 